Many years ago, I uh, presented quite regularly on technology trends and the future and the adoption of new technologies and trained and educated people on what was around the corner. So I was into, you know, many moons ago, I was introducing, uh, you know, YouTube to Canada upon its launch in 2009, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, and talking about the ramifications and implications of it in our communities and in our culture. And so I was kind of this, you know, prognosticator of all things great related to technology and how it was going to, you know, save us and connect us more as, as a community and make our lives better. Because that's what it's for, right? It's meant to make our lives better. It's meant to improve us. Um, there's a paradox there, though. And I think it's happening, and it's quite evident, um, it's quite evident in society right now. You know, there's so many people that are afraid of technology naturally, but there's many people that are addicted to technology. It's making us less connected instead of more connected, right? And I want to kind of, if you will, try and reimagine media. And I'll skip forward because I've talked about a little bit of this already. You know, why do we tell stories? You know, well, something I'd like to do even, even, even before proceeding, and I, I wish I, I remembered this previously, but it's really important to know, you know, what's past this prologue and where we come from, you know? With that said, it's, it's important for me to acknowledge that I'm on territories of the Cree, uh, the Métis, and the Salto people that had many stories before this story that I'm presenting to you right now. And I have an obligation and a responsibility not just to acknowledge that, but to continue in a path and a flow. If I had just introduced myself in this space without acknowledging what the context was, or what, why we were all here, or how we're all connected, I don't think that would be a very responsible story. A story, I think, is a gift. I think when you, and this, this applies to whether it's advertising, any kind of communication, there's a gift inherent to it, you know? Whether it's laughter, joy, knowledge, sadness, fear, horror, when certain individuals become extremely good producers, they're able to replicate that at scale, and that's a true gift. That payload of laughter, joy, and it, it can scale and happen every time. You know, the, the film that makes you cry every time, the commercial that makes you laugh every time, it has that payload, it has that gift, and it's delivered consistently and repetitively. And that's a great, great art. Something that technology has uh, disrupted is this idea of whose story is it anyways? Who does it belong to? You know, what brand is, is, it, it owns this part of a story or what network owns this part of a story? Speaking of IP and e and and all that, you know, with an advertising, one person with a broken guitar can take down a brand across social media in seconds, right? Um, User-generated content can, oops, excuse me. User-generated content can replace entire networks. I remember um, in 2010, uh, putting my hand up and asking for the microphone at the back of a large audience at Banff when four of the major broadcasters were up there singing the praises of Canadian content that year and having studied the launch of YouTube's launch in Canada pointed out the fact with a, with a crew of new friends by me that uh, if you take all four of them and combine the Canadian content they produced that year times it by two it still didn't equal three months of free Canadian YouTube content uploaded. You could have heard a pin drop. And everybody that was standing by me sort of took a step back and went, I'm not with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no deals that year. And, and this disruption in the marketplace has, has been profound, right? Like, it's been profound. It's like Facebook, there's two billion people on Facebook. It's replacing news. We don't know how to filter it or, or organize it. We, we don't even know what's real on it anymore, right? We've lost, it, it's being curated by algorithms, we've lost the, the sense of the provenance, where it comes from, it might manipulate elections, but it also creates the ebb spring and, and throws corrupt governments out of power, right? Technology is profoundly transformative and we're kind of swimming in a deluge of it. 
right? The great, uh, a great pioneer in radio and television, uh, Edward Murrow, said the newest computer can merely compound at speed the oldest problem in the relations between human beings. And in the end, the communicator will be confronted with the old problem of what to say and how to say it. Right? We have more data swimming around right now that was produced in 2017, that were produced in entire human history that we have recorded, by like going back beyond the Rosetta Stone. You know, if you take that and make it one unit, we're compounding that every three months. So think about that. Think about that conversation, but think about that level of information, all of that text, right? And what is it? Sometimes it's just absolute nonsense, like somebody tweeting, I ate an apple, or I bought new shoes, or I hate you, or, you know, and we have all this technology surrounding us. We have more technology in this, in this phone than launched a person to the moon, you know, a massive amount more. And, and what are we doing with it? Mostly launching, you know, angry birds at pigs, right? Like we're not connected to it, right? There's a term called nomophobia. And um, I'll skip to it. There we go. And nomophobia is being documented and recorded um, by many people that sort of observe technology. It's real, too. It's, it's the fact that um, many people uh, under 40, when they're removed from their phone, for more than five minutes, will begin to experience anxiety. And we're observing that there's a physiological process that's actually happening as a result of that. Pupil dilation, inflation, respiratory, increased breathing, pore dilation. It's a physiological process now, right? It's not just like anxiety, oh, I missed my phone, I need to check Instagram. It's actually happening on a systemic physiological level, right? What does that mean? Think about uh, your home. If, if an electrical system or plumbing, the main, went off in your home, that would put stress on the rest of the water mains and the pipes within your home, right? It would increase the stress. That's literally what, what's happening with technology. We are so dependent on this, right, that in a way we all already are cybernetically enhanced or attached, right? Because when we're removed from it, it puts stress on the rest of the system, right? There's uh, students I teach at BCIT in digital design development, and I've always done the straw poll too, that, you know, 10 years ago, 30% of them were still connected to the cable. Um, and now it's zero. It's been zero consistently for three semesters. All of their information is caught online. And I see them looking at their phones, and I'm concerned because this um, level of attention, this level of involvement that, again, I have been on the side of saying, this is going to change everything. This is how we're going to transform stories and tell, tell stories and connect as a community. I've seen both sides of this coin, and it was really slowing down and, and, and focusing on important things in my life that gave me a new perspective on that. And I looked at the other side as well. And I look at the fact that within Facebook and Instagram, we're producing each individual. We're all curating our own Facebook timelines and pages. We're producing this version of reality, this curated content version of reality. And what I notice is nobody, you know, it, 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 it's pretty, and it's framed, and there's filters on it, you know? Nobody Instagrams a bad day or a shitty average cup of coffee, <laughs> right? I, I don't see that. There's tons of shitty cups of coffee. There's tons of bad days, right? And there's tons of, you know, average this and that. And it's not a real conversation, and it doesn't have the dynamic of a story that we kind of need in our media, in our society, right? And I'm worried that some of these things are creating 
detachment and even depression in certain ways as we become increasingly isolated against one another. Yet, here we go. I think we've seen this before, right? When I go all the way to that dark side and start to get worried and all that, I kind of come back to this, what's past is prologue, right? Because I'm, I'm going on technology, oh, technology is making us antisocial, right? I'm worried about my kids, I'm worried about all of us. Technology is making us antisocial. And then I found one of the times that was written from a long time ago, technology is making us antisocial, and look what I found. <laughs> Right? This technology thing is removing us, is making us, you know, stare away from one another, you know, stare at a screen or a page, right? And it's just as old as that Rosetta Stone. We were like holding tablets, staring at tablets, looking for the information, seeking the truth, right? Right? Stories are human. It's, it's in our nature. I think we're always going to get back to that, right? It's what we've been doing since time immemorial. We're trying to find meaning, right? We, we look for joy in all these other things, but I rediscovered a book, um, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And, and this psychiatrist surviving the Holocaust discovered that it's not just the joy in this, that it's the meaning we're looking for, and it's the meaning that gets us through the harder parts of life and the real trials and tribulations and the real shit that you have to go through. We have to find meaning, right? Stories, no matter what, the platform, the place, the format, the screen, they'll always have a home, right? It's important to make them portable, malleable, transferable, right? The beautiful example Lee gave of, of, of the screenplay becoming the book, right? Right? The beautiful example Trish gave of saying everybody's story can be uploaded and assembled, and it some, suddenly becomes something beautiful if you organize a structure to it, right? They'll always have a home. We can't get too attached to that. This is a, a project a friend of mine named Barrett Lyon uh, did in 2001. It's called the Opti Project. It uh, sits in the Museum of Modern Art in New York as well. And what that home is, is that's the internet. That's the first graphical, digitization of mapping the internet, an attempt to map it, right? That is the internet. Look at that. Look how beautiful that is, first of all. That's the system, right? That's like this extended human nervous system that we're all part of. You know, we talk about going to events like this and you're hoping to gain knowledge, to get a gift of that, to meet like-minded, you know, people, form a tribe, share experiences, exchange some business cards, but there's seven billion people out there sort of connected to one another that you can reach almost at any time if you try to find the filter, the story, the voice, the commonality, right? The space. What's also profound is that when you talk about audience and reach and I find it fascinating working in technology where, working with startups where, you know, even 20 years ago it took a lot of money and a lot of infrastructure to come up with an idea to launch as a, a web service or a web application. And you needed, you know, $2 million of somebody else's money to build your server infrastructure and get your foosball tables and your robot coffee machine. And you launch this thing and it might be a complete failure. Now it's three people in a coffee shop on free Wi-Fi that can like scale based on Amazon services and launch these ideas. And what's even more profound is, you know, you can have a few kids in Kelowna or Regina, you know, targeting a city in Duluth or a place in South Africa with a specific message or story that's relevant to them Buy some ad words and watch not just a story, but a business or a brand. You know, it's, it's completely connected in that way. And it's really profound when you think about reach, right? Right? And, and then if you, if you get into language, you know, you, you cover like English, 
Spanish, Portuguese, Hindi, Arabic, right? And, and suddenly you like reach most of the globe if you can scale that, right? I have five loose predictions. I thought, why not have a list? You gotta have a list when you do these things. Um, I think storytelling will become increasingly platform and social centric. What I mean by that is there's already digital giants that are creating platforms and aggregating them. And there was an experiment in the last two years where content producers were actually trying to make money on these platforms and the verdict is in that you can't, right? You can't quite pay for your content on these vehicles, right? You have to find the money elsewhere. You, they can support and leverage the audience to bring back to that. It can be extended in additional content. But these platforms are going to have to exist independently and you're going to have to create some of them, right? And they're going to have to be dynamic, responsive, and social. The good news is they can be really small. They can be tiny. Right? The content within those nodes and within those search can be very, very hyper-focused and hyper-specific because content's gonna become increasingly customized. Um, creation of content. I, I strongly believe that users, employees, and randoms, I love randoms, will continue to become influencers, broadcasters, and disruptors. You have to find them, right? We did a project uh, around the Olympics um, in 2010, uh, it was a content marketing piece for Molson, who was a big sponsor of the 2010 Olympic Winter Games, and they had this crazy challenge. They're like, we wanted, we're gonna send 12 employees to Vancouver to cover the games. We have a very small budget. It was, it was like just above six figures, and we wanna tell a, a web series episode every day in English and in French of the day. And there's 12 of them, follow them around, can you do that? You're freaking joking, like, do, do the math on that. Like, full coverage, camera, editing, all that. And around the time, as uh, this is before GoPro owned the market, there was this thing called the Flip. And it had a little USB cable and a red button. And as I was still doing technology reviews, I would occasionally there'd be a knock at the door and some new gadget would come in and a whole bunch of flips came in when I was trying to solve that problem. And I was like, oh man, I got it. We'll give all the employees flips, but we're gonna have to get them in early. So we got them in early, we got these 12 employees flown into Vancouver three days early, and we taught them the rule of thirds. We taught them lighting. We taught them, like, see that white wall over there? You're gonna move over here and use that for bounce. It's gonna fill in this. And while you're getting close to that person that you're interviewing, you're gonna throw them a soft lob. What's a soft lob? It's asking a really easy question, like, hey, you like hockey? Instead of, like, I understand you've been indicted. You're, 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 gonna, you're gonna warm them up, right? You're gonna warm them up. And we took these 12 ragtag groups of, you know, they, they came from the bottling factory floor all the way to, like, sales and turn them into journos. And the craziest thing happened. One woman who was like, what, 61, all tabernacle, like tough as nails, tattoos, all that, worked on the bowling factory floor. When the media couldn't even get into this one uh, after scrum event, like got in, whipped out the flip, and interviewed Johnny Rochette and got the scoop on the rest of the global media on that interview with a freaking flip for this teeny project we did, right? And I was like, what? You know, this happened. And, and so this is happening around the, around the world. It's, it's disrupting brands. Um, you know, we still have to pay for content, right? And, and so you either have to find a story that fits the brand or a brand that fits the story or your story becomes a brand, right? Right? Look at Vice, you know? Look at, look at GoPro, look at Red Bull, right? These are brands of storytelling, right? And you can do that on a really small scale and have a really loyal audience and target them very specifically. You know, I did a marketing campaign recently where we needed to reach a small group in Vancouver of millennials for a credit union there that's terrified that nobody wants to bank in Vancouver anymore because millennials will never dream of buying a house in Vancouver ever. Like ever. There's just no point. Everybody bikes, so they're not driving cars. So they don't need loans for a house or a car or anything. They don't need the, and the only money's going to avocado toast, so <laughs> they don't need the banks. <laughs> this is scaring the crap out of financial institutions. They're like, you know, Yes, and our whole, whole existence is so that we can have their debt for life to some degree, right? Or paper on them, right? 
So what we were able to do was just in a very specific location, find all the people in target advertising on Facebook of people that had just liked Vice and Vice Canada, very specifically, right? And were interested in some asset or thing. And building that, we built an entire web series around responsible investing and introducing financial literacy and all that. And, and went to the streets with amateurs again, took their internal team and scaled them up to be an entire production team in a very short period of time. And it was very successful. So you've got to find these people in your company. You've got to find these people in the wayside that, for whatever reason, are attached to your story, your project, your idea, your brand. And even get in front of the naysayers. I remember um, working with Molson. Uh, somebody was taking the crap out of the brand or something, saying it was really shitty beer. And the chief public affairs officer that uh, I worked with at the time showed up right away in the Twitter feed and said, hey, I'm sorry you don't like our brand. We've got lots of other brands. Would you like to enjoy some of those? And the person was so taken aback by that immediate presence that it not only disarmed them, it brought them on board with the fact that there was connection and community and conversation and somebody willing to be human with it, right? Speaking of human, I'm going to show you this if our sound's working. And let's just enjoy this for a moment. This is a new favorite composer of mine. Imagine a place with water. Maybe it's from your childhood, maybe it's from recently, maybe it's a place you've never been. after I told them what it was. And I played with another friend just a couple days ago that was over for dinner, didn't give the precursor. And she was like, oh, I love it. It reminds me of Prague in the rain, right? And I was like, that's the context, right? We all interpret stories, film, meaning in different ways no matter what it is. It's a human context. We always have to remember that these things are tools, right? There's a great opening scene in 2001, A Space Odyssey, that I love. Because it shows you know, the, the, the pre-human ape fighting in the two tribes. And there's a point where the one tribe against the other recognizes the, the bone, picks it up, and uses it as a weapon, and, and succeeds in defeating the other tribe. And this beautiful throw in the air and a cut to a satellite. Right? It's that. It's that cut and that tool that I think is the moment that that was human. The recognition, the intelligence of the tool itself was what made us human, was what separated us from apes. And it's a, it's a, a liner note that that satellite was actually meant to convey a kind of Star Wars style defense system in the, in the, in the, in the back uh, notes of the script. 
And again, these things can be used for good or for evil, depending on the intent. So my third uh, prediction is that attention as we see it, like where our gaze goes, in this, you know, huh, you know, more data in a year than 5,000 years of human history, how do you sort it? How do you know where to look? I think that our attention is going to become tokenized. Right? By that I mean the way that compartments of our gaze and our, our, where we invest our time and our attention and focus will be measured. And I believe that technologies such as blockchain and AI will transform entertainment and how we do that. Right? If you look at the role we have as producers and content creators, and yet you look at the disruption Netflix has created, they spend, they've saved almost a billion dollars in churn last year, but they spent more than half of that on technology and algorithms to create and produce and feed the content that was most relevant to you in the right way at the right time on that feed, right? Um, I believe content will become increasingly personalized and hyper-focused. By that, when I'm looking at that Netflix algorithm and feed, it's an understand, that's the difference between a broadcaster. I remember when I started out producing years ago, we were a small independent ragtag group. I used to have to beg, borrow, steal the Nielsen ratings from a buddy that had them, that paid the, the money, because we didn't know. And then I did a web series and was like, wow, we did a segment on sex robots and it, it, it quintupled our previous segment. Go to the writer's team, say we need more controversial stuff like that or edgy stuff like that. And it worked, it was real time, it was dynamic. And we were able to even understand through analytics who was watching it specifically and how to target them. The old model moved very slowly. It still does, right? And so does the model of content production. Taking a page from startups, the three people in a cafe, we need to work on rapid prototyping and build content that scales quickly and cheaply even. You know, I know that's a scary word to say, but why can't we put the, the approach and the methodology before they even scale so that we can iterate, so that we can fail fast on projects, right? And quickly produce content that gets taken up and, and reaches the audience that we want and find our audience rapidly, right? The, we're seeing bubbles of podcasts and hyper-local interests spread out, it's almost, digital is almost replacing local news in small pockets of publishing and magazines all around, and there's such great opportunities there, right? The mass media blanket thing is failing, and what's happening is all these little blooms and daisies are popping up of, of hyper-localized, valuable, relevant content to people in their places and spaces. This is probably the most positive one I, I, I really like about the whole trend I see, is that it's social, you know, we gather in villages and communities because we're social. We want to share, we want to exchange marketplace. We don't want to be alone with our backs against each other, you know, typing on a screen. And I think we're going to demand that. I think we're going to, like, platforms that fail are going to be transformed by the fact that we have this basic human need to be connected, right? And I think the platforms, as they, as they become increasingly monopolistic, will also probably Shadow, we're already getting people that are saying we have to break up some of these monopolies, it's a natural trend, and then these small daisies are popping up that are then bringing better value to communities. And what I, what I think is going to happen is we're going to get back to human. We're going to get back to connection. That disembodied distraction that we have from all of these posts or whatnot are going to bring us back to new vehicles that connect us to one another. And I believe it's already happening. I think there's an interesting aspect to this too within ethics is, you know, who are we responsible to in this story? Um, who is our community? Does the person telling the story have the advantage or does the audience in interpreting it? I think technology has changed that as well, particularly from mass media and who's owned the story and who produces the story. And I think it's, it's shifting. Money, finances is also shifting it dramatically. We no longer have the same budgets, the same dollars and figures to produce some of these things. And many of us also believe that, back to meaning, 
that the work and the projects we do have to have some kind of impact. Again, working specifically focused on millennials, many of them want to know, not don't want to be advertised to or sold to, they want to know there's some value attached to a story, idea, project that somehow connects with them, and then their ears are engaged, then their spirits are engaged, then their gaze is worthy. Um, there's a project I'm just going to show a quick clip of, um, amongst a couple projects that, uh, experiments really, um, that I try to get involved with. I um, am a partner in an indigenous accelerator in Vancouver that's been focusing on content, storytelling, and business ideas. And one of the things we did was with the Calouse First Nation, we went in and we trained a number of children and tweens and teens how to fly drones with heads-up display and all that. And this was rather interesting. Um, one of the mottos of Indigenex is reconciliation through innovation. And there's an interesting thing that happened. When an 11-year-old is flying a drone over claimed territory that, that the Supreme Court hasn't yet recognized, and is literally mapping it out and flying above it and controlling this viewpoint, it's, it's a really kind of post-colonial recontextualization, and it was rather profound to observe, enable, and to help film. Um, I'll show you the short clip here. And some of the kids worked on this too, which is amazing. How's it going to help me? What is this? What, what, what is drone technology? And how is it going to, how's it going to help me as an individual? We still can live that traditional ways, but we need to make balance in life. And we need to open our stores to the new advanced things that are coming. What do you experience for yourself that you're able to start understanding, like, why are we getting so excited about it? And, you know, the technology of drones is evolving. There's all kinds of uses for them. I think it opens up a lot of opportunities for younger generations. It's a way for us to communicate, it's to monitor our territories, to be involved in the rest of the global world. <laughs> Did you see the young people that come to a party that they're, wow, look at this technology. It's in your diet now, but I'm, I'm fascinated today. Eh? I'm fascinated to learn from many generations ago. We embraced uh, technology as the better way of doing things. And that's how we're expressing that now. Another project that I'm working on, uh, and a project actually that, that spurred this is uh, something that goes on in the, in the investment world that's guns are blazing right now, but still controversial at times, is um, I, instead of IPOs, a lot of people who have uh, accumulated wealth in the cryptography space, in blockchain, in related technologies, in Bitcoin, uh, ICOs, initial coins offerings to launch projects. Is, is, is huge right now to fund projects. Everything from entertainment projects um, to entire platforms. And there was a project that was unveiled in a white paper called the BAT, or the Basic Attention Token, that was uh, created by founders of both Mozilla and PayPal, um, with, with some experience, that is looking at ways to use ledgers or blockchain technology to reward, and monet monet to reward and monetize the way people pay attention to media. So instead of just assuming that you have an audience and they owe you their, your attention, the, the actual flow of resources and value is starting to shift to say, we will we'll pay people or reward them for observing content, right? Uh, a, I worked with a group called Think uh, out of Amsterdam around design thinking and solving problems, systemic issues. One of the projects we started looking at was transportation uh, and sustainability. And we noticed in Vancouver that if somebody that's driving on the road, it's $1,500 per capita per annum to 
go on a roadway, yet a bike lane is 50 bucks per capita per annum. And we're like, how do you get people from bikes to roadways? What's also interesting is the way that you move in life is fairly repetitive. Like 90% of your movement is, is repetitive. You go from home to the same coffee shop to work to school, whatnot. But if you take my geolocation data and map it to your geolocation data, it's as unique as a fingerprint or a retinal scan. Right? It's biometric, it's an audit trail. So you could very easily build an app that takes Bradley Shen from fiscal 2018 driving, $1,500 per year, right, to the, to the municipal uh, impact in the coffers, to barking at 50 bucks a year. If you can prove that and have an audit trail, you've just relieved $1,450 from the coffers. It's before you calculate carbon, which also has a value, right? Put carbon into the economy, start to move these things, you have to measure them, you have to have a ledger, you have to know where the information is going and flowing, and then you have to map it. So we're building an entire ecosystem that's mapping that movement and also building on top of that a reward system or loyalty system for better choices in transit and accumulating points and rewards within transit and then building a content layer to further incentivize people. So if you have two minutes and 37 seconds to your next stop, maybe you'll see the next Netflix trailer for the show you've already been watching that's two minutes and 37 seconds because the new season has just been uploaded, right? or relevant content to that thing. Again, remember Netflix spending over half billion dollars on that type of retention. Um, another project we did uh, with Indigenext, it's astounding to note that in this area, right in Vancouver, is the Maritime Museum, the Planetarium, the School of Music, and the City of Vancouver Archives. Yet, nowhere in this field, right near the beach and the ocean where Bart on the Beach is and all that. And we did a collaborative project with the Indigenous College there where we taught um, sketch and unity to some Indigenous students, 15 plus, on the site where the big house was, 1880 and previously, and then destroyed in 1903 without a single damn marker. Like, there's no sign of it. And so what these students were able to do was put it back where it was in VR and do a walkthrough of it, and they created it, right? They created that space. That's the end of my presentation. I'd like to leave it open for questions and comments if anybody has them. I might have missed a couple slides. Let me quickly go through. Some other trends, just to, to close, that um, might be helpful to some of you, is the idea of rapid content prototyping, the idea of creating small packageable stories that you can quickly test to market. It's the same thing as startups, same thing we do all the time in, in the startup world where you build what's called a minimum viable product, an MVP. It doesn't have too many uh, exhaust systems on it or it's just the four wheels and the frame. And then you launch that and you see how people respond to that. You adopt an audience, you build your community that way. I mean, I think we're really stuck in, in these sort of old modalities of production and we need the 50-person the crew. I, I, I built my career with like three people and a, you know, and a run and gun operation and, and it um, has served me well, although it's also limited me somewhat. And it's, it's something that I think though with all this disruption, all the generalization that exists in digital markets too is necessary. Um, borderless online tribes is another thing I think is important just because you're seeing it happen in bad ways and good ways, in, in reactive ways. Um, you know, people supporting prejudice online that quickly swarm a thread, you know, Godwin's Law and, and, and things happening on internet threads and, and these tribes come out of the woodwork. Finding the good tribes, the people that want to swim with you and run with you is really important. In the beginning of Web 2.0 development, a friend of mine started blogging about a problem they were having with their company and they couldn't deliver to a client. Everybody went, why are you doing that? You can't tell people you don't know how to deliver something. But somebody quickly in India 
started feeding on that blog and helping them solution it. And then seven people from around the world were building that solution, right? Somebody from Q Publishing saw that thread, sent them a manuscript for a book they were about to publish on Web 2.0, and, and quickly, um, that person started blogging about it, an unpublished manuscript, maybe you shouldn't do that. Public, then took all the feedback from the people around the globe, posted in a bunch of stickums and sent it back to the publisher. The publisher sees it and goes, holy. Comes back to my friend and says, uh, we, we're letting go of the author, will you please write the book? And that's how my friend got his book deal, right? And these tribes exist all around the globe. And I think back to that model of like, whose story is it anyways, and who can you collaborate with, and who can you work with, and maybe your audience is somewhere you didn't even expect. We have to think beyond just tax credits and provinces and countries with stories. Um, these new transparent models, that speaks to that. They're, they're, they're breaking the old ones, you know? Your cards don't have to be this close to your chest. You can accelerate the growth of a story, you know, and your mission by doing this. Um, Rewarding customers and employees for content, absolutely. Build that fold into your, the life cycle of your entire community, your tribe, your organization. Deputize everybody, whenever possible. You know, I worked with some Fortune 500 corporations that had a one-page social media guideline. One page you can get it down to. It doesn't have to be complicated. And export globally now. I mean, the world is that extended human nervous system. I was, you know, sitting down with my son and I was just um, enjoying Mr. Bean and it was such a beautiful thing for him to watch and I realized how magical it was and what a simple global export it was because of the scalability of, of, of the comedy and it was so pure and simple to me that here was a beautiful story of somebody that didn't fit in because he didn't always recognize how people were feeling or what they were doing but never was afraid of trying, right? never was not going to step in and not give it an attempt. And my simplest version of my bio, as it said many, many moons ago, was I just click things. I'm not afraid. I just click them. I try them. I fail. I keep going. Some of them are miserable failures, and some of them are freaking awesome. But I'm never going to stop, and I'm never going to give up. And I hope you keep clicking and stay connected. And thank you very much.